Hold up. There we are. That should be coming through all right. Uh, I don't. I don't have. Can you guys say something? Somebody say something. Hello. Okay, okay, you are okay. currently watching hey, the stream. Hello. All right. <laughs> okay. Now you're blowing it out. Okay. Yeah. Everything is coming through well. Let's get. Uh, I think it's all good on the YouTube end. We've had a few people complain. Um, might even say whine about the fact that the last YouTube stream was very short. We didn't stream the whole thing. So because of that, now we'll came under pressure and just everything is going to be streamed today. So the lesson and then the feedback, it's all going to be there. So you guys can review it. But I will do a lesson that I've prepared before we do the feedback. And um, since we've been meaning to add an additional session on Fridays, check it out. I, I, you've probably already heard this, but uh, it's going to be Teaching Tuesday on Tuesdays and Feedback Fridays. Fridays. Ooh, I like Whoa. that. Oh, that's crazy, right? That's a brand name. <laughs> revolution. Yeah, I know, I know. That was actually my idea, but you know, I don't, I don't need to take credit for that or anything. But uh, <laughs> but uh, th this session is then gonna be for the art one related stuff because it's teaching, you know, that makes sense. And then the feedback Friday is gonna be for personal art or really anything, right? Uh, that was my idea, and I thought maybe for Fridays I'll do like a, just a general Q and A beforehand, and Tuesdays I'll continue doing lessons before the um, the actual feedback sessions. So hopefully you guys have art what related stuff, and we're also gonna. This is the sad news. We're gonna have to limit the amount of feedbacks uh, we're given. So it's gonna be eight today, and then we'll see how s s much of a slog it is because I talk a lot. So maybe we'll need to limit it more, or maybe I need to actually pace myself better. It's going to be one or the other. But uh, yeah, it's going to be eight today, <clears throat> And you, but you can't post them. I have to tell you, I have to give you the cue to, po to post your uh, stuff for... Uh. for <laughs> you can't pre-post it. No, I'm kidding. I guess you could post it, but uh, I'll, I'll start with my lesson here. It's going to be pretty short, <clears throat> and um, then I'll open it up for some questions, and then I'll do some... Uh, feedback as, as we usually do of course Ellie's gonna be there for feedback as well hopefully hopefully she comes by the time I'm done here and um, yeah some of these photos are kind of awkward this one feels just a little odd but uh, <laughs> the thing that I want to talk about here um, which is something that I see a lot in the feedback and that's kind of how I get the um, yeah no personal art today yeah but that's how I get ideas for um, the, the lesson um, topics is just the stuff that I see recurring with people, the stuff that I see people making mistakes at. And uh, a big thing that I see is when people pose and, and they feel that something's wrong with the gesture, they'll ask for feedback. And most often the issue is in the torso of the figure rather than the limbs, uh, for example. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is just the fact that the torso, and, and some of you may already be aware of this. So, some of this is kind of fundamental but it bears repeating so the torso if you look at it from the front it doesn't really have any apparent curve in terms of shape right it's just kind of flat like this this is a very good reference for that it's pretty blocky but if you look at it from the side it has a certain bend to it where the three major masses those being the head the rib cage and the pelvis are all sort of at opposite angles so just to sort of uh, mention this as well, the head and the pelvis you can vaguely sort of take as similarly sized, right? And they're uh, vaguely sort of, um, how would I say this? This is three thirds, and then this is two thirds of that. So they're, they're one third smaller than the rib cage. And this is just sort of a general uh, measurement. And then you have another third for the neck. So this would be the, the missing third there. And then you have the other third here. In between the ribcage and the pelvis so it's effectively three units and then they're divided so that a couple chunks are missing for the neck and the area between the ribcage and the pelvis but the important thing the point that I'm making here is that the ribcage and the pelvis are both tilted and of course they're tilted the opposite way and the neck is then sort of a counterbalance to the ribcage as well which people also often kind of miss out on so it's from the pelvis, let's say, going this way, and then the opposite, and then the opposite again, and then the head will tend to be in these sort of very static, uh, just standing poses, the head will then just be flat. But the neck is sort of a stand-in for this third rhythm, let's say. So we get something like this. 
And while that may be more apparent from the side, this kind of a configuration, it you can also show it from the front. And uh, you can't really show it, as I mentioned, in shape, because the shape is flat, but you can show it with depth, right? So instead of making the rib cage, if we're drawing it out as a block to sort of show its perspective, instead of making the rib cage and the pelvis both flat like this, so those blocks would look something like this. I'm drawing through them just to show it's the same kind of perspective and they're parallel. They're they're not parallel, they're at angles. So I want to emphasize that. And from the front, it would look something like this with the rib cage. I'm gonna draw it out as a cylinder now. The rib cage going backwards like this and the pelvis going backwards like this. So if we connect them together like this and at the head, we sort of get kind of an accordion form where if I draw the cross contours, they sort of turn around like this. So the ellipse here and the ellipse here are opposite. And as I said, again, this, this is not a kind of dynamic shape. It's still a flat shape, but it is a more dynamic and a deeper form. And you can use that instead of a shape exaggeration to show depth if you really want a completely flat front view. Whereas, more obviously, if you're looking to exaggerate the standing pose from the side, you could just simply tilt the ribcage and tilt the pelvis more. Which I actually did here when I was illustrating the ribcage, if we just draw it a completely flat horizontal, it's actually really pretty subtly tilted. And then the same thing with the pelvis, but I made it more apparent. And I did that just to illustrate the point, but you can also do that to make the pose more dynamic and more interesting. So. That is something that's innate and built into the way that the body naturally balances itself, R regardless of, you know, the other things that we can do to make standing poses more interesting, let's say. And I want to talk about that uh, now, and then I'll sort of wrap it up with, like, an actually dynamic pose, how you can exaggerate that. But keep in mind that, again, th there's a natural curve going sort of, you can say, I guess, backwards to the whole torso, and you can use... Uh, well, cross contours and the uh, depth cues to show that when it comes to front facing poses as well. But a very powerful thing uh, that, that you can utilize if you have the ability to manipulate the standing pose a little bit is to create a counterpoise, which is just a, a type of um, weight bearing where one of the legs carries most of the weight. And if you, if you sort of pay attention and analyze reference, you'll notice that people actually tend to stand like this very commonly. Actually, it's pretty rare to see that somebody is bearing weight uh, evenly across both legs. But the reason why that's relevant, or the way that that shows itself in the body is by the hip of the leg that carries the weight kind of coming up, or maybe in other words, the hip that's not carrying weight dipping. And then this effect of asymmetry, which is crucial. Asymmetry is really, really important when it comes to creating an organic effect or when it comes to creating gesture in general. So you can, you can keep that in mind as well. But as the asymmetry is created in the angle of the hips, it's echoed the opposite way, kind of similar to what's going on in here, actually. It's echoed the opposite way in the shoulders. And this is another principle that's more broad when it comes to thinking about gesture, which is the fact that when the body balances itself out, it will usually have one angle and then the opposite, right? To, to balance itself out, kind of obvious, but it bears it bears mentioning like that. And then because of these two opposite angles, the connecting line will sort of bend. So effectively the action of the torso here will be bending sideways. And it's not really strong, right? For example, you don't get something like this where the torso kind of squishes, obviously, which you might get in more extreme or more action he poses, but it's definitely there and it shouldn't be overlooked. And let me actually draw out the way that I would uh, go about this. The way that I draw out a, a pose like this is to always recognize these angles first. It's, I think, the, the best way to go about it. So I'll lay in the opposite angles. If you don't do this, often you can sort of get, um, you can sort of just forget, I guess. And it's, it's kind of funny how often you maybe have an idea to draw something and then if you don't lay in like concise marks sometimes you just forget about it so I'll always lay in this asymmetry and think about it consciously and also then uh, of course it's gonna show in the bending or I guess the tilting of the ribcage and the pelvis and then by extension the neck will also kind of 
counteract this. So we're getting a very similar, actually a very similar kind of a rhythm to what was happening in here. If you look at it that way, we have you know something like this going on uh, with the body, and that tends to that that kind of a counter balanced rhythm again tends to feel very uh, gestural or feel very natural to the body. But then, uh, of course, when I have the angles, when I have the body, it's also kind of important to keep in mind when placing the legs. And that's not, that's not really the point of this little lecture, but uh, I think it's helpful to think about the leg that bears the weight often kind of being more in the center or, in other words, being sort of at the point where the center of the gravity drops. So you can sort of take the pelvis or maybe the, uh, the navel and drop a line down and where it meets the ground, it's, it's often where the uh, foot will be sort of roughly, right? So in other words, this foot will be more kind of under the body, whereas this other one can go off more because it's not carrying weight. So it might look something like this and you'll notice sometimes that this uh, not non-bearing foot can bend and which is also it's kind of similar to this idea then where instead of necessarily having very different shapes for the feet you can have different depths so this one coming forward and then this one sort of going backwards like this and that's kind of the application of that idea with this uh, reference and then you can see the same thing happening very reliably across different uh, images so if you just look for standing poses you'll see this very, very often. And this is a very good way and a pretty simple way to add a kind of a dynamic aspect to a pose without necessarily needing to do much work. I'm, you know, if I do this, I'm not really considering the personality of the character or even the attitude of the character. It's just sort of the way that the body will often tend to uh, place itself. And then I can do maybe something with the arms as well additionally, but here as well, if I lay in the angles first, and I place my structures on top of those angles, I can get a, a nice setup. And if I just maintain that clarity, instead of, and, and what I mean by maintain clarity is when I lay in this line, this angle, I rather make it more extreme than make it flatter because as I add the anatomy, I'll naturally, I think, kind of push back and uh, make the gesture a little bit weaker and a little bit less emphasized. So. It's better to go harder and more extreme with the initial placement of the gesture than to go more meek, because then if you add the anatomy on top, you might just end up with something that's going to end up stiff, as opposed to something in between, which is still better than, than not stiff. So here we can see a similar thing going on, uh, maybe less so than in this reference. But if I was kind of trying to modify this as well, of course, the first thing that I can do, and that's sort of the final point that I'm getting to, is modifying uh, poses and trying to exaggerate them. But the first thing that I can do is just make the angles more extreme, bend the body more. And as the body bends, as I mentioned in here, I can start getting kind of a squishing effect on one side, which will tend to feel uh, more impactful, show that bending uh, action more strongly in the form itself. And then I can take this foot or this uh, leg and have its foot being more in the center and then push this one out more. And uh, in certain instances, if you take this really far, you can start kind of breaking the pose and losing the balance. So I want to mention uh, that as well and mention sort of a, a tip on maintaining balance, I guess, which this whole actual lecture was sort of because uh, so we, we had an idea of kind of condensing certain little bits of the courses and making them into these lectures. So this one is based on the beginning of the anatomy course. I just sort of ex expanded on some things. But one thing that Antonio mentions in there, which is actually quite helpful and I didn't consider, I always thought of the balance of, of the figure as primarily being based on the center of gravity, which will tend to be somewhere around the navel, as I mentioned. So if you take that and if you place it or just kind of drag it down vertically, the foot or one foot at least should be somewhere around there. Uh, and in other words, if, if, not, if both of the feet are on one side of that, as let's say like <clears throat> this, and then the body falls over. And that's true and it's helpful for standing poses, but once you get into poses that have more action and start bending, it's also helpful to consider another point of weight, I guess you can say, which is the base of the neck, or, or I guess broadly, maybe this shoulder girdle area. So as the body starts bending, it's helpful 
in order to make it feel balanced to take the pit of the neck drag it down the same way that I did here and then make sure that some some of the feet one of the feet at least is sort of on the other side of it because if if both are gonna be for example in here even if the pelvis is dropping down the way that it should and is being balanced there's just sort of too much weight on this side of the body and it might start feeling uh, like it has no balance and like it's falling over so those are the two points to keep in mind the navel and then the base of the neck right here in the neck is again more relevant when the body starts doing crazier actions uh, but with with those couple ideas out of the way I also want to mention and, and talk about how you can exaggerate poses that already have certain action as well as I guess in general how you can give a, a gesture to any pose that you're making and I've sort of alluded to that latter question and I said you have to give the torso some action uh, either the the natural gesture that it already has ideally emphasized and exaggerated or any of the the three actions that the body or the torso can perform which are bending and twisting but bending let's see let me try it out like this bending front to back let's see like this bending side to side so those are two and then twisting as the final one so if you have one of these actions the pose is going to feel much more uh, gestural much more dynamic and if you have none or in other words even if the body is for example at an angle like like what I'm drawing out here like even if the body is not completely vertical in space if it does nothing if it doesn't bend and if it doesn't twist it's still gonna feel sort of rigid and stiff because our bodies really don't tend to move this way the spine is very flexible and it tends to rotate and bend the the two masses the two big masses the pelvis and the ribcage naturally so this kind of a configuration is actually very it just feels stiff and unnatural and that's the broad kind of concept that you should keep in mind when posing out your characters and, and if you're sort of feeling that something is off even though let's let's say for example like i'm drawing out my character and i have something like this and the legs let's say in the arms as well everything is sort of dynamic and everything is kind of moving crazily but it still feels a little stiff then i can just do something with the body so maybe i can bend it more like this and i can feel more dynamic or maybe i can twist it but with with those three actions as being our sort of framework to or, or i guess the the puzzle pieces the building blocks of torso's action those are going to be the ones that we're trying to recognize in the reference and then trying to exaggerate and i think it's really helpful to think about this consciously and ask yourself when you look at the reference before you even start drawing uh, what is the body doing and with with that in mind you know you recognize well this torso is bending back and it's twisting just exaggerate those those actions so it's not even necessarily a visual thing uh, but rather more of just like a, a gestural idea so I can and and of course it's gonna kind of show itself it's gonna materialize as a visual drawing but uh, if I recognize that it's bending then I can just make a stronger curve which is pretty obvious and if I recognize that it's twisting then I can make it twist more by having one of the forms and this is the the way that I think about twisting is having one of the big forms of the body the big masses be at a different orientation at a, at a more different orientation so naturally they would both in a, in a neutral pose face one way to make a twist stronger you just make them face <coughs> more different ways so in, in this case the rib cage would be more frontal than it actually is here it's kind of a three-quarter I can make it more of a frontal view and that way the twist is gonna be stronger this might also be somewhat kind of self-evident but it's a helpful kind of way of framing things so I'm placing the center line in here whereas realistically it would be more so around there maybe and that way the rib cage is almost seen from the front which is again all in the in the surface of making the gesture stronger and of course you don't always or you really shouldn't always try to make the gesture stronger but this is this is a talk about how to do it and it's usually usually the issue is that you know instead of the gesture being too strong it's uh, too weak so th that is you know s simply and broadly how we go about this so I just recognized it's bending it's twisting and I made it stronger but then also on a surface level 
when the body has a, an extreme action, we'll often see it shown as a sort of a, a squishing, almost like a pillow, like this, squishing. There will be the extra mass kind of being pushed down on. And so you will get a squished side on, or a, a compressed side on one end. And then on the other side, you'll get a stretched um, kind of counter reaction. And you can make the stretch flatter and you can make the squish rounder. And that way you can emphasize the action even further uh, even further than sort of the orientations of the uh, the masses and then another final thing that I want to mention is the head will tend to follow the center line of the the body and so if the body is rotating this way for example most commonly you'll see the head rotate alongside it and really it's not the head following the body but rather the body following the head so if you look somewhere if you look off somewhere you won't just like rotate your head your body will start rotating along with the head and of course you can have situations like this where that's not the case but it feels pretty natural to do this and um, really the point that I want to make is if you don't do this it can feel kind of uh, strange and staged so that's just uh, something to consider it is this continuous kind of rotation not only through the torso but also the head kind of following along with that torso and with with those couple tips out of the way I guess that would be everything that I wanted to cover so pretty brief I think hopefully and uh, I want to open it up for some questions if you guys have any I guess both on the YouTube end and on the uh, discord end so we can talk about more, more stuff. And Ellie has arrived. Uh, let's, let's clap it Hello. up. Let's give a give an entrance. Where's the uh, Where's the soundboard? Do we have like a fashionably late as always? No, no, I'm not late. <laughs> Sorry, this is the best one we've got. I, I don't know. That's a long applause. I don't I, like that. Sorry. You know Sorry. What? I didn't know it was that long. <laughs> it's kind of cheeky, bro. <laughs> Do you, do you hear uh, me alright? Yeah, we can hear you really well. You're very defined. High definition sound. You know, I've, I've uh, seen on Antonio's Instagram that you're having a competition. No, I'm not. It's a one. It's a one-way competition. He's competing with uh, with the. I don't know, cause I'm not in it. You know, I'm. I have not what accepted. What do you mean? How is... <laughs> he can't compete with me if I don't accept it. <laughs> Without, like, asking. He yeah. Like, you in his yeah, he just like... tagged me like that. And uh, but he knows, like, oh, <laughs> he knows I don't do muscle ups as well. We talked about it. Like, I think you were there actually. He like he he was talking about doing muscle ups, and I said I never I never do them. I just don't ever practice them. And so now with that mm. armed with that knowledge, he's probably trying to mog me or something. He's trying to. We well, you only have to do three. So. <laughs> but then, but then you... the idea is then he does four, and then I should do five, right? Which I, I don't know if I can do even, I can probably do a couple, but uh, I don't want to dislocate my shoulders. Why not challenge him to something you know he can't do, maybe? Um, well, I don't know if he can't do anything that I can, that's the thing. He probably can't do like weighted pull-ups the way that I can, or his numbers are probably lower because he doesn't do those, I think. But that's kind of lame, you know, that's a little bit lame. It's just like, hey, I know you don't do this, let's, uh, let's, uh, let me challenge you. Yeah, yeah. It's a little weird. Hey, he did it to you, man. He did it to you. Yeah, yeah. He publicly just disparaged my image. Pretty horrible. Oh, man. Well, if you don't participate, you might hurt his feelings. So. Yeah, I wouldn't want to hurt his feelings. That would be horrible. <laughs> but uh. God, Sylvia says that that she'll challenge him to Zumba. <laughs> I like that. I want to yeah. see that. He needs to record his Zumba dancing. That'd be really funny. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's start with some feedback, guys. So. Wait, wait, wait. Up a little bit. Yes. Are there any questions about this well, you whole asked, thing? Like, ten minutes ago, bro. Well, you completely derailed this entire conversation when you came in. So, um, let's let's see. If you have no questions, you have to type it out. You have to say. Perfectly explained. You explained it so well. It's almost immaculate. Perfect. You sh just tell me that, and because uh, then I'll know. Then I'll have like feedback. There's a question on YouTube. It says I find it hard to approximate the extent of how much I should bend in perspective. 
um, which I guess is is a um, a question about how how you know or how what, what kind of a cue you can look out for to decide how deep a foreshortening is when it comes to the torso. So uh, I don't know if I phrased that in any way understandably, but I think th the question is like for example in here when I, when I'm working with the rib cage and it's going back away. Uh, let's say I have I have an actual reference where instead of standing flat, the figure is leaning back. How do I know exactly how far back I should lean? Which is a good question, and uh, it's I think it's more difficult to actually answer than than this. The I think a helpful thing when it comes to torsos in particular is looking at this plane here. <clears throat> I don't know if this is gonna be. Uh, coherent at all but the the rib cage I'm gonna draw it out here actually, actually maybe I can draw it out over here the rib cage has a of course the the overall bend to it the overall overall angle again if we're drawing that out from the side view it looks something like this but then you'll notice as well that the neck connects to the rib cage at an angle on, on a sloped plane like this right and this is the neck coming out at that angle and so the sloped plane in a different perspective, in this particular perspective, might look something like this. And so if, if you can learn how to recognize the nat neutral, I guess, flat view of this slope, or in other words, if we're looking at the ribcage from the front without it bending back or forward, and you can sort of see how, how big this plane is, then if the ribcage will bend backwards, you can see that this plane foreshortens. So Again, this is the, the plane in question where the neck inserts. And the reason why it's useful is because the ribcage naturally has that plane, but also because the shoulders kind of follow that, uh, that plane roughly. So it's, it's a helpful approximation. So if you look for this and ask yourself, or, or kind of from looking at reference and from kind of prior experience, have the ability to make an educated guess about what the neutral size of this plane is when you're looking at it from the front, then you can kind of, let's draw it out actually. If I see a plane that's flatter and bigger like this, then it's reasonable to assume that the rib cage is coming forward. And if I see the plane that's more foreshortened like this, then it's reasonable to assume that the rib cage overall is bending backwards. And then if the plane is somewhere in the middle, then the rib cage is seen neutrally from the front. But um, I guess that, that's one cue to look out for. Another is, of course, foreshortening. So if you see the ribcage is very short, you'll know that it's coming forward in perspective a lot. And you'll know to open the ellipse of the cylinder and make it very foreshortened like this. So I guess maybe the, the most fundamental and maybe the most helpful answer to this would be to get accustomed to drawing cylinders, whether it's a cylinder for ribcage or a cylinder uh, for the pelvis in perspective or boxes for, for that matter, so that if you have the ability to rotate a box and know how it foreshortens in practice, you can you can see that and you can recognize that in a reference. That, that one might not be as practical as this because it's less kind of surface level and, and more fundamental, but ultimately this is the, the underpinning of that understanding. So hopefully that uh, helps a little bit. <clears throat> but, is that it? How to invent the poses? Yes. Yeah, one guy Susan? asked, uh, how do you, um, where is it? It was Zine. And then H how filed. Do you with poses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, normal poses. Yeah, that was mm, a good question. Normal, I, I suppose, isn't just like standing poses, not something very dynamic or, or actually. Yeah, yeah. Just, just natural poses. Not crazy, uh, just to read poses, but like normal standing. But keep it grounded and like, uh. Well, nice looking. Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Um, one thing, I've sort of covered a big, big chunk of it, and this is the the big chunk of it, actually, is if you just pose the body asymmetrically somehow, you already get... All, and when I say body, I just mean literally just the torso. If you just make that asymmetrical, you get a big bulk of the gesture from that. But then other things that you can consider, apart from this counterpoise is 
twisting. And of course, it's gonna be more subtle when you're just doing a kind of a, a more subtle standing pose. But as an example, I can have the body just say I'm, I'm doing it like this. I have the legs, I'll make it kind of simple. <laughs> it's gonna be a good drawing. The, the legs and the pelvis are sort of for, facing this way. And if I just rotate the body even, even slightly like this, I already get a lot of dynamism. Even though I'm not really doing anything dynamic with the rest of the body, the rotation helps. So, in other words, I'm actually just essentially talking about these three actions and looking to include them in a more kind of subdued manner and usually probably not in combination. So, if you if you start twisting and bending at the same time, it might be a little too much. But you can do a little bit of each. So, you can bend the body a little bit by using a counterbalance or a counterpoise like this. And you can twist the body and then you can do a combination of those. So, let's, let's actually do that. Um, Let's say that the body is looking, or the pelvis is looking flatly towards the front like this. I'm placing the leg that's bearing weight more in the middle, this one more to the side, and then I can twist the body maybe to look off and have the head, as I mentioned, follow along with it. So the head might be kind of a profile view like this <laughs> and already have a very dynamic standing pose. So that's one thing that's not really related to the character, but rather just like abstract or broader figure drawing or gesture drawing um, concepts but I think maybe even more importantly uh, apart from you know having this basic understanding you should also just consider the, the character's personality and the character's attitude and I think it helps to act it out so when it, the character when you're just doing sort of a design for the character it's gonna be standing anyway so you're, you're not playing out a scene but you're playing out a way that a particular kind of character would stand. So, as an example, the character could... It actually tends to come down, I guess, the posture of the character tends to come down to the torso and the shoulders. So the character could maybe, like, stand like this with the pelvis, sort of like a cowboy stance, with the pelvis really forward, which and, and the shoulders and the... Uh, shoulders back and the chest high, which tends to feel very... confident and then you can have the character on the opposite end of this just bend over slouch lower the head and this is something that people don't really consider as they will actually think more about these principles and these pr principles are the underpinning they're sort of the tools with which you draw this but try to consider how a character of this personality would stand what kind of an attitude or posture it would have or they would have and then try to kind of translate that into these terms like well if if they're standing confidently how does that what does that mean for bending and what does that mean for twisting for example but that's uh that's my answer to you all right so thank you hey of course uh, all right so i think we can move on to the feedback now let's do it so, um, if you guys didn't know, I think a lot of you understood because these are all like ward feedbacks, but uh, on Teaching Tuesdays, we're now only providing feedback for art ward or the portfolio cycle related stuff or fundamental things. And then on Fridays, we'll be doing personal feedback. So basically on anything, like how Teaching Tuesday was, is, is what we'll be doing on Fridays, just so we can split it up a little bit and then... Um, spend a bit more time providing feedback to you guys um on fridays and tuesdays yes so, sir with that being said let's start uh angers angs i don't sorry i'm butchering names here uh they won't help with proper shadow mapping unhappy the last pose okay so well to be honest i think you're on the right track i mean they look like pretty decent studies um I think with your shadow maps, you know, you have a, an example in the bottom right of where you're using like hard edges and like a, the lasso tool, I think. But then that kind of goes away in your main studies, like the two like coloured hands, which to be honest, they aren't even that bad at all. They're pretty good. Um, but I think try and focus on like the clearest form of the shadow maps in your studies, and that should help you uh, have more have more defined shapes 
And then also, you're missing the uh, Terminator, or like, I guess the, I don't know if it's the half Terminator, you know what I mean, I mean, like the bit, uh, the, the, yeah, I think I know what like you're, it's like super saturated bit, yeah, it's like, you, on the reference, you see it perfectly, so between the, the shadow map and the light, oh, you mean this? they have this Terminator, this um, I, I can't, the, what are you pointing at? One sec. Show? On the fingers, like this? No, 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 no. Go on to the reference image. Is this one right? Down below. No, 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 no. They drop the art. <laughs> the art. There, there, there. Okay. Oh, you mean, yes. you mean like a saturated half tone between yes. the, the light yes. and the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you're lacking that in yours as well, which actually adds quite a lot in terms of the shapes and readability. So, um, don't forget that. And again, maybe just be a bit stronger with your uh, shapes to begin with. But honestly, I think you're on the right track. I think these, this is a uh, this is pretty good. So, all right, Oggy. Yes, you, yes. You. I would I would tend to agree. Yes. I th yeah, I think the the drawings are pretty good. Like I think the the T overlaps in particular are very nice. The way that you're uh, showing depth on the on the thumb, but also on the fingers, and this overlap as well is pretty nice. So I think they have solidity to begin with. But then when it comes to mapping the shadows, I think. What Ellie mentioned is is really the um, the most important thing is is you have to start, and I I can't really overstate the importance of this. You have to start with a clear shape. What is that? What is that? I think it's Laura. You should get a mute in there. Just she got banned. All right, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, you have to have a clear, crisp edge to the light and the shadow separation, and you'll eventually. Especially if the light source is atmospheric, you'll lose that crispness. But if you don't have a strong shape, and what I mean by that is, I'm actually just kind of selecting in here, and I, I very often use the lasso for this because I can get a completely crisp shape that way. But I can start with a shape that has a lot of definition. And because I have this control, because I'm not going fuzzy and soft right off the bat, I can design it clearly and intentionally and then when I block it in like that and this is sort of how the blocking should look I can go in and add softness where needed and I'll add the softness around the form shadows that are between or that are on a soft form right on a cylindrical form so if I have a cast shadow for example I don't need to do that much softness or if I have a hard edge sort of a crisp break I don't need to do that much softness either but th the issue with this um, setup is Essentially that you're not really recognizing the the hard shapes, which is why it feels fuzzy And let me actually instead of just talking about it. Let me actually paint it over here And if you're using this as a reference and just having the the opposite Light source th that that works because you can literally just take the shape of the light and use it as the shape of the Shadow and and vice versa. So I'll do that. I'll just take this shape And I'll uh I'll lay it in as the light instead of the shadow, but I'll be very strict with it. And, and it takes, of course, it takes time and experience to be able to kind of recognize these shapes. You're not, you're not gonna just be able to do it right off the bat, but this is a, a necessary prerequisite to, to start doing that, is you need to have a, and of course this is not a perfect blocking because it's quick, but you need to have a hard, clear edge in order to really be able to do it. Because otherwise you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot with a, with working with a soft brush or a soft edge. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that can help clarity is, of course, when I block in the shape, I can have a higher contrast and a stronger grouping within each family. So the shadow is overall darker and it's more of a flat value throughout. And the light is overall lighter and it's more of a flat value throughout. So it might look something like this in this example. And that way the difference between light and shadow in value is large enough so that we actually recognize them as strong separate shapes. Because if I, if I have a strong shape and the values are still too similar, it's not really going to read very strongly. Or in other words, I'm not really going to have a very strong form read or a form illusion, which is not necessarily... Sometimes you don't want that, but here with, with this kind of a setup you probably do and that's that's sort of the lens through which I'm looking at this so this is an over simplified over emphasized version of this of course you would have half tones in here and you would have little kind of ambient occlusion shapes which would 
kind of sculpt the uh, the form but when you do add the darker half tones in the light be sure to wrap them and, and kind of group them around the terminator around the edge uh, between light and shadow and then another thing that i want to mention when it comes to blocking in the shadows is if you have especially if you have a local light source like this so let, let me actually show this same idea in here i guess another broad tip that that is kind of the fundamental underpinning of this is you you also have to relate your forms as much as you can to simple forms and to practice lighting the simple forms. so if you know how to light a cylinder in here then you should kind of by and large at least generally be able to light the fingers in this kind of a light so just practicing the cylinder is is easier it's more convenient and it's more focused and then when you have the ability to light cylinders reliably and, and believably just kind of transport that knowledge here but I think the point that I wanted to make initially was that you can cast more shadows this is actually really nice I like this uh, block in but I think for example the thumb could very easily cast a shadow in here and kind of create larger shadow shapes as well uh, because you have to consider where the light source is spatially but when I when I set it up I would probably do something where the light again is larger like this and flatter and then the half tone is just sort of a, a little band between light and shadow I usually don't want to overextend the half tone because that will muddy up the distinction between light and shadow so that's the the broad point that I want to make and then the final thing I'll end it with this is when you have a local light source like this <coughs> you can once you set up this difference you see it's sort of flat I could probably make it a little flatter once you set it up you can make the you can create a stronger fall off so I'm just using a gradient in here to have the intensity of the light become weaker as it moves further away from the light source like this but uh, yeah those are those are a couple tips so hopefully that helps all right now we have uh, Ian um, this is our first one so I appreciate any tips but especially about the final drawing sure so for your first one, I mean, good job. I don't think your final drawing is that bad at all. Um, so I'm actually going to give a bit of feedback on the uh, build up to it. So the gesture design and fundamental bits. Oh, whose feedback is that? Oops. You, who was that? That was the, uh, the previous one, right? No, no, no. The I heard my own voice. In my... Oh, you're talking about <laughs> feedback. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think everybody's muted now. We're good. We're no, good. I hit... Oh, whatever. Anyway. I don't. I don't. Uh, so, um, it's fine. <sighs> I actually think you need to uh, add a lot more gesture into your designs. Like, th like they look really quite stiff. Uh, obviously, like this is your first ward, so I wouldn't stress too much about it because it will come with time. And your final really isn't like that bad at all. Um, but I think, you know, trying to work on your gesture is probably going to be really beneficial for you. So keeping your lines looser, really thinking about what the gesture is, what their action is, um, how you want the, the, the line of action to, to flow through the piece would be really useful. Um, so yeah, I would actually go, go back and work on, on that a bit more. Um, and there is, it's hard to describe how to work on gesture without doing like a demonstration, so I'm sure I'll be, we'll be able to, to show you a bit Yeah, this is, this is kind say. of a, a perfect, uh, you know, relate, I guess I can perfectly relate it to the lesson. Because, uh, and you can, you can see that in here, the gestures that feel dynamic are the ones that have a nice kind of curved movement through the torso. Right, so even even for example, something like where was it? Well, like this, it it has a strong action, but because the the torso is so flat overall, right, it's just straight. It doesn't really feel that dynamic. So without, as I was talking about, without necessarily needing to do anything with the limbs, if you just make the action of the torso stronger, and those actions again can just be essentially bending and twisting. So in this case, bending back, for example, in this case, bending forward which might look something like this and the head of course is an extension of the spine so it will often move when you exaggerate things if this is bending forward more then the head will be lower this is a good example as well where even though the the character kind of 
it, it's twisting, but because the center line is not really showing that, it, it kind of loses that element of the action. So if, even if I just do something like this to show the twist with the, the center line, and then I could probably also just make it a little more obvious, like so, with the shoulders, it just becomes a little stronger. And here, adding a bend would be good. But all of the little kind of overpaints, this one is really nice, but all the little overpaints that I'm doing are essentially based on me looking for an action in the body from those really three actions. So it's not it's not as if you have too many options, uh, but there are combinations of those options. And one thing to also keep in mind is when you have the, uh, the clothing, I'll, I would also uh, sort of, I guess, not necessarily ignore it, but try to look through it more often it will kind of conceal these actions especially if it's very baggy so you have to ask yourself what is the body underneath doing and very often some folds will actually show that so for example if the body is bending like this here you will often have folds going this way to show that bending so that, that can be a cue but uh, you also would sort of have to imagine uh, certain things and then when it comes to the limbs I think they're, they're less important I guess overall you can you can have pretty stiff limbs, but um, I would I would kind of look to bend them a little bit more I guess uh, overall and keep or use straights very intentionally. So if I have this is sort of a straight, it's bending a little bit, but if I have a straight like this, it will tend to feel very tense, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not what you want in most cases. You'll see sometimes like Frazetta's uh, paintings will will have like completely flat arms and then like um, holding a sword or something or, or an axe and that feels very tense for a reason because there's like tension and and gripping uh, and and it's supposed to kind of that action is supposed to drag attention attract attention that way but if something is supposed to feel kind of uh, dynamic and moving and flowing then that's probably not. Uh, a good idea and so when it comes to the arms what can help is looking for counter uh, counter rhythm so for example in here you will uh, often have something like this and when it comes to legs th those counter rhythms are often more obvious but the way that you find them and this is this is the the final point that I want to make is the way that you found or the way that you can find the rhythm in or decide upon what kind of a rhythm you'll use is by looking for the longest continuous curve on the um, on the silhouette. So if the let's say the the arm it has like the deltoid and the bicep and then this short bridge muscle here, but then it has a long triceps down here and a long flexor group on the forearm, then you just use something like that. That can be one way to do it, and often you can also kind of bias counter. Uh, or opposite rhythms so you could use the tricep on one end because it's such a long shape and then use the other side as this and kind of create an opposite rhythm that way but uh, those are sort of ways in which you can decide how you're bending uh, limbs because limbs are essentially straight so it's, it can be kind of difficult and you can often break them a little bit if you're not taking this into account but those are a couple of specific um, notes and, and when it comes to the posing, let's say just to sh sort of show this in uh, in action. When it comes to the posing of this character, to make it a little more dynamic, if that was the uh, the intention of the wad, you could just use a pose that has a stronger asymmetry. So just putting this leg back here, more underneath the pelvis, and then dragging this one out, which would work even better if this is bearing weight. So you could maybe have that. At the opposite angle so you have three points of weight bearing and you can push these even more I'm, I'm over exaggerating of course and then having the opposite angle here in the shoulders that would that would be a nice kind of way to exaggerate this pose which is not necessarily to say that there's anything wrong with that but um, it's just sort of an idea to think about going forward but those would be my tips all right. there all right uh next we have uh, this is the, for the drapery course. Um, do you want to take this one, Oggy? Because I'm bad at drapery and I don't actually uh, see much wrong with this. As a matter of fact, I do. As a matter of fact, I'm not very good at drapery. Let me just take a sip. What did it say? Are there any forces that I'm not taking into account or anything that isn't working well with these? 
yeah, as, as Ellie said, I think they're overall working quite well. And I, I have been giving a bit of uh, feedback on your, uh, your entries for the uh, Drapery course. So I think, I think it's overall going in the right direction. I wish I had the reference as well. Uh, as, as kind of pertaining to the forces, I think it's overall, again, working well. But maybe certain smaller things, which is something that I actually talked about in the previous feedbacks, could be done more specifically. So what I what I mean by that is kind of rendering small transitions and, and rendering like folds themselves, if that makes sense, and particularly like their cylindrical nature. Uh, so, oh, there's the references. That's pretty good. Let's actually just find one to kind of, where are they? Maybe this one. Yeah, just find one to show in in practice what I'm talking about so it doesn't sound uh, kind of so this is the, uh, the reference for that which is very nice you can look at it <coughs> so again rendering or I guess approaching the smaller folds particularly as the um, as the cylinders what, is, what do you mean the final drawing got cut off did I not, uh, I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> if you look at the reference, you'll see that the folds are, as I keep harping on about, they're cylinders and they wrap around in very particular ways. And you will often have a tendency to kind of outline them. And this is kind of exas exacerbated or just emphasized when you're using a liner. So th that is a, a limitation there, but um, when when you get this overall movement, which I think again works well, but you, you could maybe push it a little bit in in terms of simplifying and trying to find just a single curve. So for example, here you have essentially a continuous curve going this way, but what you do is you break it instead of being a, a C curve, you make it an S curve, a very subtle one, but still, and it feels less forceful than if it was just going back like this. And if you want to emphasize it, then instead of making it a, uh, a C curve or making it an accurate Instead of making it an S curve and making it an accurate C curve, you make it an even stronger C curve. There I got, I got it out. I, I, I verbalized it like this, for example. So that's that's a little kind of aspect to to keep in mind and to watch out for. And it's it's a broad gestural idea. So looking for longer curves is something that can help, and recognizing them. So another example here, which you know you may or may not include, is this curve here is facing this way but you face it the opposite way and that could be a conscious decision but it's it's mostly about just being conscious and recognizing intentionally what what's going on but to actually get to my main point of the the cylinders this here for example is a pretty clear continuous cylinder like this and then there's another one in here so you have a kind of a negative shape there a cylinder another one and then another one and often if you don't kind of build up the um, the drawing patiently I guess you'll just kind of make it very vague in, in these sort of areas with compression in areas of detail in other words right and that, that tends to happen pretty often so I think practically the way that you should look at this is I, I would do a, a kind of a more detailed under drawing if you're if you're doing stuff with uh, a liner and I would look for longer rhythms because these are cylinders and that's the point that I want to make, but the cylinders have big rhythms that connect. So for example, this whole thing kind of connects, right? And you can, you can see that it's very subtle with the value, but it comes off in here and it does something like this and then it curves around and you have the other one and the other one, right? And if you don't look for those connecting rhythms, you'll, well, for one, you'll lose your cylinders and you'll have fewer or lesser than is on the reference, but you'll also often lose uh, kind of an element of gesture because the connection of these cylinders actually tends to feel very natural and dynamic. And if you don't connect them, if you don't think about the way that they're connecting, so this is an overlap, for example, in here, and then these two go all the way over and kind of overlap in here. So this is all, for example, a single kind of connected cylinder 
form. If you don't consider that, then you'll have kind of a choppy look. And that's a little bit of what's going on in here. By and large, again, it is working really well, but I'd look for these longer rhythms in here as well. For example, this other cylinder comes around, but it's connected, whereas you have sort of a, a chopped kind of three-part structure in here. So I guess that's uh, in here as well. Like this is an S-curve, a very long cylinder. And of course, it's not equally as deep all the way through, but you need to create that underlying rhythm for a more natural and more gestural look. But yeah, that's, that's my, uh, I guess that's my main point and the most practical thing that you can do here. All right. All right. Uh, Simon Skeleton says they would like tips on their first dynamic poses award. Thank you. So I know it sounds like I'm recycling the same feedback, but um, I think he needs to think about the line of action and your gesture within this, like really exaggerate the bending of like the spine and the torso, um, especially on the one where like he's jumping back and like, like in the air, like you could really add a lot more bend to that, right? And then, um, the alternative, not alternatively, but uh, another thing on top of that is, in some of these I feel like you sort of don't quite understand the form that you're drawing, and it kind of shows that, like, the, the, like some forms look a bit flat, like in the in the legs, for example, like, you don't, you're not sure which angle to draw them at, um, you're not sure how it would look in space, so I would always keep that in mind, like, what forms are you drawing, what would they look like in space? And then how would you add gesture to that as well? Uh, some really aren't that bad at all. Um, you know, I think you're for, sh for sure on the right path here. Um, just like a little bit of tweaking and these would be pretty good. Um, so I don't mean to sound a bit, you know, I don't want to... Did you just cut off for me, Ellie, or? Did... Did Ellie cut off for you guys as well? What's going on in here? What's going on, big guy? Uh, it's a little weird. Did she drop? Oh, you, you hear her? Why don't I hear her? The hell? Wait. So you guys, you guys can hear Ellie because she's not, uh, she's not coming through on my end. Hmm. What the hell? Let me let me, let me restart uh, Discord. I'll do that real quick. Jeez Louise! Technical difficulties. Yeah, I think something off with Discord here. Just end that task. <clears throat> Noise. Yeah, you, you don't hear her because I don't hear her on my end, but let's see. Ooh. Are we back or are we not? Ellie, say something. Actually, as a matter of fact... Hmm. Yeah, my Discord is not connecting. So I don't think that's... I don't think that's Ellie's fault. But the other stuff is working, so... Like, I can open up other websites. Mm. I'm gonna restart it again. Shit. This stuff got me messed up. Right. Um, is Discord down? Discord status. Uh, partially degraded service. That was a little, that was a little spike. No route. What does that mean? This is, this has not happened before. This is very odd. No route. Reboot your modem. I can't do that. I 
time I just have to restart the whole freaking uh, brother. But it's like the the stream is still working, right, guys? Oh, there oh, we go. Oh, Holy. Oh, oh, that's good. That's great. <laughs> All right. I don't know why it works now, but it does. So he was giving me the uh, the haunting no route notification. He says you have unstable internet connection on your Discord. Yeah, I'm picture. fully unstable right now. <clears throat> I don't even know. Guess uh, Damn. guess we're back. So the profile look. picture, bro. <laughs> well, they heard, they heard my feedback, but okay. I, don't, I don't. I don't need to say it all again. I heard so the bulk of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just give yours. It's it's okay. We're talking about I'm I'm on the right image though, right? I didn't lose myself here. This is it. This is the one. The one. Right, 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 right. Ellie, right, right, right. Yes, that is the one. All right, perfect. So, the gesture feedback I want to give here is kind of the opposite of the previous one, or I guess the issue is is not as present with the torsos i think you have nice torso action you could like emphasize that and make it clear with stronger center lines i think that just helps when it comes to building things and often i think you kind of lose the form and, and ali mentioned that as well but not only in the sense that you bend it which is not necessarily actually bad if you bend the rib cage it's actually pretty good for gesture and that's that's obviously the intention here but you also kind of like mess up certain angles and just deform it in ways they're not necessarily because of bending, right? So, for example, in here, this uh, ribcage, if you place it as a flat view, would literally look like this. Like, this plane is incredibly wide. And I think that's just a symptom of maybe a lack of experience of drawing boxes. So this is this would be the ribcage there. And um, you just need to spam the boxes until you're able to control the proportions. And the reason why we draw cubes in particular that have even sides and consistent proportions is because then we can know if we lose the proportions and we can we can practice for shortening better so i think that's that's a pretty uh big issue here when it comes to the torso but the uh, the perspective is actually or not the perspective but the gesture is actually working quite well here for example you're not connecting the spine in the center <laughs> And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily belabor that point, but the actual gestural feedback that I would have here is in the limbs, <laughs> and particularly the legs. So if you're working with cylinders, of course you have a cylinder, it's flat like this, and you take it and taper it, <clears throat> and now you're working with a tapered cylinder, which resembles both the structure of a thigh and then the structure of the calf. Uh, but what you can do further is bend the cylinders as well and looking at this from the side most people are familiar with the fact that the thigh will bend this way and the calf will bend the opposite way and i think that in particular can be very helpful to exaggerate here and from the front so this is a side view the front view would have sort of a double bend inwards like this so this is the pelvis and they're both bending in like so right like that so it's sort of a b uh b gesture there and an s curve in here of course from the back it would look the same as, as from the front and so for example in here since this is seen roughly from the front you can take the whole cylinder bend it a little bit more take this whole thing bend it a little bit more and it would feel more uh more gestural and in here as well especially as it's for shortening you can have a stronger visual bend and uh i think it's it's most obvious or most applicable with these side views that you have in certain instances like for example in here you could do so much more bending if you're looking to exaggerate the gesture of course but also you know on top of this idea of maintaining proportions when it comes to rotating the uh, forms of the torso in space you also should probably look out for proportions of the whole body because for example this um, and you can do that by just moving or sort of lowering the limbs in arcs and this arm is very long so if you lower it here <clears throat> it would be below the knee almost like if the leg was flat so taking these and kind of flattening them out and kind of relating them in that context can show you how off they are uh, in in action he poses but yeah like this pelvis is really small as another example so it's it's a long process of kind of 
getting all of these aspects to work in tandem uh, and you can't really practice them all at once so I think you're doing good work here but pick out a couple of these ideas maybe actually just one so for example pick out this idea of maintaining the masses I think that's most relevant and <clears throat> try to apply that on your next sheet of studies and then if that's working better good if not then do more boxes and do it again but if you know you figure it out then you can add gesture as another separate thing that you're studying and then you can add worrying about proportions don't worry about all of these things that I mentioned all at once because then you'll just overwhelm yourself and I think the, the quality of the images will drop because you're overthinking I think one aspect is enough to consider uh, again I think starting with rotating boxes and then going forward but yes what? great who do we have next? <coughs> uh, we have... Okay, uh... The thumbnails. thumbnails. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, these kind of remind me of the, uh... The thing from Stranger Things, the... The Demigorgon, or whatever. Yes. Um, yes. I think these are coming on. I, I think the weakest one is probably the middle right because the the two characters feel really squished together like the composition overall feels squished there's not much breathing room but the other two i quite like um they're a lot stronger as well they had a bit more depth they they have more room to breathe you could say um i think these are pretty good i think what i would do is i'd maybe um add a bit more to the tentacles like you've done it pretty well on the on the bottom one in the background character like you've made them all a bit bit bigger, bit of space, you've added them quite quite nicely, but on the other ones they feel a bit squished, right? You could add a lot more to that, you could say. Um, but overall, I don't have an awful lot of feedback for this yet, because obviously they are just thumbnails. Um, apart from the fact that, as I say, the one on, on, in the middle is very squished together, I think it's not very strong, uh, but the other two have a lot of potential, so I would maybe focus on those two guys with you, personally. Um, like, other than that, there isn't a lot to really say at this stage. Just uh, keep on trying to, to push out um, more of these, or render more, or like, see what you can do with these ideas. But unfortunately, I don't have a lot to say, but yeah. <laughs> yeah I, don't know, I don't know if you remember, but we actually gave feedback on the, the early version of these thumbnails last time. The, they were just in a, a sketchbook. And I think the, the feedback has been applied really well. Because my main point, and I think yours as well, is just to make the sizes of things different by adding depth. So I think that's working. Like, for example, in here, the, the application of that made this so much more dynamic. And that's why you can, for example, talk about these smaller aspects then, because this overall broad thing works. Whereas when it comes to this thumbnail, the reason why it's not working, apart from sort of maybe odd uh, placing on the canvas is also just because it's a very flat view so it feels like they're both the same size and they're both seen sort of parallel which is generally quite awkward when it comes to, to scenes things usually especially figures usually don't stand that way and we usually want to create some size variety to make things more dynamic so this works and this works and you could probably make it work even better if you just pushed it a little bit further still so for example just making this even smaller and making this even bigger, increasing the size variety that way would feel like the perspective is even stronger than the conversions is even stronger, which is really nice. You could probably somehow maybe echo that in the back as well with maybe larger cliffs or, or these buildings here. And then as you go further away, they would diminish in size. So you would have kind of like a grid actually given to you by these uh, buildings as opposed or the cliffs I'm not sure what they are but or maybe like ruins as opposed to being flat like this this just feels like a kind of a overall rectangle whereas a more triangular shape would give you more depth and you could apply that here as well if you like this is seen kind of from a flat view which is going a bit against the figures so since it's so high up beneath the uh, horizon line you can probably show more of the bottom plane but on top of that you can foreshorten both that plane of course and then the whole thing as well so that would also gain a more triangular shape overall and feel stronger but um you know you can apply that here as well if you like but i think this one works the best and i, I would choose this one to to move forward maybe because of the the nicely kind of tilted um horizon but i, I think it's it's working really well maybe because this frames the whole thing very nicely but uh as i mentioned with the uh, the tentacles i think 
here they work well because there's kind of a nice variety of spacings between them there's a, a kind of a big medium small to the negative shapes if that makes sense so there's a larger negative shape a, a medium a small and so on and they're also kind of spaced irregularly whereas here this is kind of both in this example and in some of the other ones there's sort of an odd symmetry like for example here there's kind of a star pattern where they radiate very obviously and in here as well like these two are for example pretty similar in size and angle right they're just kind of flipped so it, it makes it feel symmetrical here there's also kind of a, a rigid type of a pattern which is the the radiation and in here the shapes are just so merged they they form almost kind of like a <coughs> a brush shape in here and uh then like these two for example are pretty parallel and these two and these two whereas these have different directions so i would try to apply some of that asymmetry primarily like just looking for different sizes of things or in other words big medium small but also looking to not repeat angles as much as you can so for example maybe because the um, arm is so low maybe you could raise it up a little bit so you give a little more space so we should essentially just be a slightly different posing you don't, you don't really have to change perspective that much and if you want to make it symmetrical raise the other one and give a little bit more space for the tentacles to then kind of have their shapes and be a little bit more uh, organic and you can add some of those shapes on this other side as well but those would be my notes again I'd, I'd continue on with this one yeah that's it okay uh, <laughs> let's see uh Joven, these are the nails i did for the current portfolio cycle are they diverse enough in terms of light mostly it's so uh, funny it's so funny how you, how you always mispronounce his name I really like that. I, I... Is it Joven? <laughs> Joven? Uh, it Joven. doesn't matter. It's really funny. <laughs> you should keep doing that on purpose. Anyway. No, no, I would. I no, but if you're not, you should. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, I think it's great. I think you have a lot of diversity in the in the setup, in the lighting, in the circumstances of this guy. I think you're really on the right path, and I would say these could be your final thumbnails. Um, yeah, if you if you maybe like work them a little bit more, like push them a little bit more, if you wanted to. But I mean, that's up to you. I, I but I do think these are great. Um, maybe it w could be cool if you did some color keys, so you experimented with different types of colored light it could be like warm light blue uh, like a cool light etc like sunset uh, or indoor light you know etc that kind of thing um so some color keys could be really cool for this actually um but overall i think you've got a nice variety um i don't think there's much feedback to really give on these to be honest um i'm quite excited to see what, where this goes in you know i i'm i can't even say which one um i think works best because i think i mean they're all pretty good to be honest and that's up to you as well so <laughs> i'm not sure but i think you're on the right path for sure i actually don't have a lot of constructive feedback here i have a um, little bit of something i i have go ahead, some <laughs> all right so go the, ahead. the first thing that i think would help which it's not necessarily a big issue here but it would make the whole thing every thumbnail more solid is if you had a more I guess solid grid that you begin with and it, it shows in, in kind of small elements like for example when it comes to this image because the um, the character is seen from such a flat view and and because of the background it almost feels like this should foreshorten more like it's sort of bending or towards us or tilting towards us it's a flatter view than maybe it should be like, like for example the perspective lines could look more like this so that's just like one example of that another one might be in here like the, the lines don't really quite seem to add up exactly and, and it's like little things maybe just visual uh, but I think having the grid will just solidify the whole thing it's not it's not much more work it's just a little additional guideline um, but that's one thing and, and kind of related to that i think when it comes to these um 
lower angles i think you could push the size of the foreground elements a little more like if this is one arm in here and these are in front of the table they they feel quite small they're smaller than the one in the back so it would make sense to instead enlarge this and you get a, a more interesting not only just depth read but also you'd get a more interesting big medium small because you'd have much differently sized much more differently sized shapes so you might actually just have like a giant looking uh, arm in the front here just just as an idea or for example in here you could probably have the body for shorten a little bit more which would just feel a little more dynamic you'd have a stronger depth <coughs> And so that's the, the second little note. The, the third one, and these are all kind of drawing based, is when you face the character one way, it's usually a good idea to give more visual space there. So I suppose you probably put the character a little more this side to the right side because you want it to have the barrel in here. But I think it would work better if, if he, sort of in a way the character had space to look. So. When, when it's like a three-quarter view, it's a little less relevant when it's a full profile like this, where there's a very strong directionality to the character, it's more important. So I would rather have the character be here and place the barrel as a way to kind of stop the movement, because otherwise, visually, it almost feels like we're going outside of the frame. <coughs> so that's a little kind of compositional note to keep in mind. And then the final thing, <coughs> which is not about the drawing, but rather about the, uh, the values and the coloring, is that... <coughs> I would be more specifically conscious of the um, the silhouettes of things. And what I mean by that is, in certain instances, like, for example, in here, or... No, I, now I painted over them. Let me actually come back. There, there's a lot of situations where you lose the silhouette, like, for example, here and here, or here and here. These are essentially the, the same value that you're working with, or here and here or here and here, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with losing the silhouette in, in and of itself, but it needs to be done very, um, well, in these types of kind of commercial illustrations, it needs to be done pretty sparsely, rarely, and uh, with a reason, or at least intentionally, right? So if you unintentionally lose the silhouette, you might end up with a weak shape composition without necessarily even knowing why that is. So I would just think about the way that the silhouette of the character separates from the background in a very simple sense, whether it's light on dark, like for example in here, light on dark, or whether it's dark on light, but I'd, I'd be pretty clear about that and uh, use probably harder edges because th like this is what is really important about the, uh, the values. You probably need to kind of be a little more specific and plot it out. A little more certainly in in a kind of <coughs> in particular I guess here it's mostly about maintaining the silhouette a little bit more in, in certain areas and if you lose the silhouette <coughs> you can lose it in in places right like for example if I have I don't know a lighter background here and a lighter background here just as, as an example and I lose the silhouette over there well we can tell we can as a viewer guess that this is the shape of the forearm it doesn't need to necessarily be spelled out for us because we can we can uh, incur based on these two parts so we have context for this shape but if you lose the silhouette all throughout then that's sort of where you start getting into a problem and again with these sort of illustrations it's usually better to lean into clarity and and the kind of a stronger sample separation rather than this uh, this loss and I think the the biggest offender here I guess if you could say that it would be this here where um, this whole and the problem is actually to kind of diagnose the root of it is because you have lines you, you don't really worry about the value separation the lines are a stand-in for a value separation but when you lose the lines you, you see very quickly that this image on a shape level or on a value composition level kind of falls apart because there's no real shapes to distinguish whereas if I just go in here and do something like this, where I maybe I darken the background slightly, let's use a linear gradient there, and then well, and then maybe I create another value for the skin, just just so we have more shapes that are distinct. It becomes uh, much more graphically readable. Do it like that. 
Right, so now this is just a, a clear, a much, much clearer composition that actually stands on its own as a shape, J just shape, a value shape instead of lines separating things. But yeah, those would be my uh, my tips here. But overall, like I think, th especially the thinking about different scenes and different narratives is working really, really well. And the drawing aspects are mostly tweaking. Uh, the, the value is actually, I think, the largest thing to, and the more, fu the most fundamental thing to keep in mind here. But uh, that's it. All right. Uh, now we have R Raphael. The, the elemental wards do you smoke? He is a smoke uh, elemental gin. Would love to critique. Okay, so, so not bad at all. I think with smoke, um, in some areas you've added a bit of um, transparency, but in others it's like not transparent at all. And with smoke, there is that transparency in it as well, and a bit more flow. I mean, I think like at the bottom especially, it's kind of hard to read what exactly it's meant to be like it, it's a bit all over the place it's not that flowy and again like you've drawn it really opaque so it's kind of hard to, to, to read it as smoke initially but I think you're almost there like in, as I say in some areas like for example the tips of the fingers aren't that bad at all um, so it's just like adding um, a bit I can't really explain without drawing over it um, but I think in, you've just drawn it a bit too opaque for the most part, and then just working on even like, even the smoke will have gesture as well, right? So include that as well. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I guess when, when Ellie says to make it more transparent, it would essentially be just more of the background showing through. Or in other words, I think more, instead of the smoke kind of wisps ending so abruptly you can just have them trail off more like for example what i'm doing here if i just trail it off more make it a very low contrast and even very soft like then we can sort of understand that from that context this is you know a soft material transparent but then it becomes thicker in certain areas but i think a more a larger problem here apart from from that particular rendering is actually the shape design which is very repetitive. The, the little tails are all the same size, sort of, right? You have very small little uh, little bits, and they repeat uh, kind of at odd intervals. So it's almost like equally spaced. Like you have one here, one here, one here, one here, one right in the middle, and so on, which feels very inorganic. And you're, essentially, in other words, you're lacking a big, medium, small distribution of them, as well as a big, medium, small sizing of them. So what I would do is I would have larger, like for example in here, and I'm just drawing this very quickly, or painting over, but um, if I have one big one like this, and then maybe one small one and one medium one, like so, this just feels much more dynamic and much more readable as well. This size variety creates a clarity because there's there's hierarchy there's hierarchy of size instead of a repetition of size and that repetition makes it unclear makes the viewer unclear what they should look at and in, in some sense so that is, that is one sort of main design aspect that I would look for here um, and a big part of this would probably just be removing some bits like I think you you don't really need to have as many to really kind of uh, make the point that this is uh, uh, made out of smoke. If you just have a couple and a few larger ones instead of so many small ones, you could essentially have the same statement. But um, that would probably be the largest thing that I would say. But in line with, with that idea, when it comes to uh, shape design, because this is essentially shape design, I would also just clarify these shapes. I think the, the candles are probably a little too much or the, the way that they're so small and they're overlapping with these semi-transparent shapes just makes it difficult to read so what I would do is with the tail I would have a bit of a higher contrast to it or kind of similar to the the Yavan feedback is I would uh, the previous one I would have a stronger silhouette separation stronger value separation so instead of being so lost I would start with shapes that are more concrete and the big medium small in this context would be more so geared towards the lengths of things which means that for example this curve here 
maybe should be longer than the next segment of the curve. So the curves would have, the segments of the curve would have different lengths, and it would also be geared more towards thicknesses, I think, with, with these very long shapes. So you would have a thick part, a very thin part, a medium part, and so on, and this is how you would get a dynamic effect with, with just one continuous shape, so it's not like these repeat, repeating shapes. You can still have big, medium, small when it comes to segments of shapes. But I would clarify the shapes to begin with, and then you can add the softness. But as you do that, uh, you, I'd still keep this idea in mind. So I would have, if I add these sort of tails coming off, I would still try to make them not too repetitive, space them at different intervals, and have them at different sizes. But uh, the bottom could be, uh, if you want to have the candles, placing them in the front, at the bottom part of the... Uh, composition but pr placing them in the foreground would probably be the better solution in here and then not, not really maybe it's just implying them maybe around this area up here somehow changing the perspective a little bit of the room so that it doesn't have to overlap with these complex semi-transparent shapes I think that would be a that'd be a good solution here but that's I think that's the bulk of what I have to say all right uh, I think we have time for one more Yes, um, it's exactly eight. It's exactly eight, like Perfect. I said. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so. Oh wait, hold up. The uh, uh, one, oh. one little thing for for Ian. That we, uh, I guess I forgot, but I, I don't know if you necessarily commented on it either. But I didn't. I didn't quite comment on the uh, on the final drawing here because I, I didn't realize that. I thought the uh, the study was the final, but when it comes to this one. Let me just give a, a couple kind of brief things. Uh, one is, and this is based on the, the reference, so you can right off the bat do what I mentioned there, which is make the twist stronger, which is to say that the shoulders would be more frontal. Maybe the, the head could lean back more, and then the shoulder would kind of displace the arm a little bit. I think what would help this gesture in particular as well is to have the sword kind of continue on from the uh, the arm in, in a continuous gesture instead of like breaking like this I think that would feel more stronger and this might be actually it would feel more stronger it would feel stronger and that would this might be a, a situation where you want to have a completely straight arm so that this is the gestural foc focal point just because it's so strong and so rigid. You, what you could also do, which is another Frazetta thing, is you could maybe have it at a 90 degree angle, which also makes it feel very tense, very kind of rigid, like he's gripping the sword really strongly, or, you know, if you want to have a looser effect, you can have this, but the, the twisting definitely could help here. You can also maybe push the depth a little bit more by having this leg kind of come forward. They can add a dynamism. This one wouldn't really need to move that much. And you could probably continue with the uh, with the gestural ideas by maybe pushing the big gestures of things like so. And I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily worry when I say the big gestures, that would mean for example the curve of the calf in here and the curve of the thigh. But I wouldn't necessarily worry about this um, rendering. Because I think, you know, hatching like this is very time consuming. And I think you'd progress more and the, your time would be more wisely spent if you did more like simple drawing block-ins and studies as opposed to spending so much time on the render and then one final thing is when it comes to these um, folds I would look to have a bit of big medium small to them I wouldn't repeat them quite so much because for example in here you have three of them that have the same size and then actually really the fourth one here as well so the, the overall idea of them I think the kind of spiral fold works quite well but I would have larger and smaller folds so that it's not a kind of just a noise so maybe it would look something like this as just a a quick paint over I have a small one a medium one and a big one and the same thing would sort of apply in here as well although I think this one is working quite quite a bit better but still these are pretty similar in size and here as well if you look at the uh, I think these are folds or maybe even armor I think as it foreshortens you'd probably get something more like this right with the armor segments all right. yep all right so the last one uh, we'll do Frank and he's got his character sheet so I think there's a couple things I want to point out with this um, 
The first is some proportional issues, like for example, the calf is like super thick and big. Uh, the, the, like it's almost as wide as the torso, which obviously isn't realistic or the case. And then the way you've stacked some forms, like for example, the arms look a bit flat. Like it doesn't seem to look like you know how to stack the cylinders on top of each other on the three quarter of you at least. Um, you are correct. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe you're over, maybe you're even overcomplicating your mannequin. Um, when I did m my first sheet, I would do like a really basic one, and then I did another one, which I'll show you now in the. I'll post it. This is a recent-ish one I did. So even mine, it's it's simple, right? It's very simplified, um, and that's the point of a mannequin sheet. It's meant to be so you can understand it and read it and use it as a reference point. It doesn't have to have multiple complex forms. It can be as simple as mine is, um, but it still looks convincing, and I still have a bit of gesture in it. Um, it reads well. So I think um, trying to simplify your mannequin a bit more and then think about how the forms would stack um the, the proportion of your forms as well uh thinking about all these small things would really help you and again like you don't have to make everything complicated like you don't have to do like a kind of square-ish cylinder for the torso and then another square for the the the, the pelvis and then uh another square for the the ribs like you can simplify it quite a lot which i think in this case you kind of need to to help you better understand how to draw the forms correctly um so yeah that's what i would do if i were you personally um but yeah okay, what do you think yeah I, th I think it's a very good like practical tip because well apart from maybe like for example in the flat view the, the proportions are still feeling kind of off apart from not maybe having yet a developed sense of proportions the issue is also just that by stacking and worrying about stacking so many forms you kind of uh, you're unable to juggle the idea of proportions at the same time i think that's a big thing and this happens to me as well i think it happens to everybody when you focus on one thing and you really zero in on it um things just sort of start bending and, and like running away from you almost like for example how the the torso here seems to be going this way that's essentially just a symptom of not having a larger form to encompass this whole thing and this is the gist of i think in the issue of drawing is like how do you add detail and specificity without losing the big structure and the big gesture that is the difficulty and as you're beginning and as you're as you're studying the basics the fundamentals it's really helpful to instead of adding the details just work on that Fundama uh, fundamental that foundation first right so you lose the the big setup by adding too many uh, details well then instead of just make a bunch of big setups with like simpler details and i think ellie's example here is pretty good because and this is this is the issue that i had as well is like <laughs> this is not like it, it's very um consistent and it's very clear, but like if you're if you're gonna eventually add like anatomical detail, this is not gonna do. But that's not the point of this. Like the the point of the mannequin at this point is not to overcomplicate and kind of focus too much on the the realistic like the surface level uh, forms. And this is the issue that I had as well. Is like the the shoulder girdle is so complex. I want to draw the mannequin, but I keep just thinking about like how does this arm connect? Don't like try to sort of disregard that. Just like place a cylinder, right? And I think that would essentially be the most practical bit of advice that I would have in general here. Is I think it would make sense, and this is probably kind of tedious to hear, but um, I think you you still as as I was talking about previously a couple of a couple feedbacks back it doesn't seem like you can really completely control the foreshortening uh, and and this is a, like a very fundamental thing and if if certain edges or certain proportions start getting away from you when you're working with a box then working with very specific boxes that interact with each other very specifically in space is going to be a kind of just just an exponential uh, increase of that of that problem like it's just going to be 
even worse and things are just going to start going out of whack uh, much more. So I would practice a bunch of boxes and I would, I don't remember why or when it was that I was talking about oh yeah it was the it was the demo the workout Wednesday but I was talking about like how you can go and I think you were there actually how you can practice oh. yeah practice like specifically the proportions of cubes and the reasoning for this or the, the why you would actually want to practice that is so because the cube has consistent uh, you know equal proportions you can know if it feels believably for shortened from any angle and I think this if you if you can work on this and sort of grind through it even though it might be tedious actually it is tedious uh, certifiably tedious but if you can grind through it and you know you don't have to be perfect in it but you have to become comfortable enough it becomes a lot easier to do this and the transition from here to here it's not you know it's not just like automatic uh, but it's it's somewhat smooth and it's it's, it's pretty uh, you know you, you won't have to struggle too much going from here to here because this is just a different like proportioned box and if you can take the cube and maintain its proportions at very specific angles or very small increments that you control consciously then you'll have a very a much easier time here but because that would probably be too tedious i would practice this alongside a simplified mannequin as ellie said so that was that was a whole lot of yapping uh, but, but hopefully hopefully got something out of it at I least to, to basically say the, the exact same thing i said to, to do a exactly but i sound smarter i sound i sound quite smart hopefully right. okay bro that is, yeah, that, yeah. go ahead that that is very helpful and i'm curious will that also help with the specific problem that at least i was asking about with the uh, stacking things on top of each other yeah. Um, and and well, well, and that's a good question, actually. The what will help specifically with that is this is one issue. the The issue of rotating is kind of its own thing. It's the ability to control the proportions of the form from different angles. But the the issue of um, relating two forms in space, it of course it's it's the same sort of group of issues, but it's a little distinct. And I think practicing that could be done alongside this by rotating the cube as a sort of um, an animation on the uh, the page. So let, let's say, for example, I start with a cube. There's going to be some good cubes here. Start with this kind of a view, and I go and I say, well, I'm going to rotate it this way. So I maybe create something like this. But I can, when I place it on the sheet, I can think about sort of how it relates to the other one. or what its spacing or, or its placement is. So in other words, if I'm, let's say I'm r rotating it this way, I can place it here. I can actually place an edge there, place the two sides and kind of relate it spatially. So it's not only a different orientation, but it's also the additional cube kind of being parallel or, or at least this axis being parallel so th that's but that's an additional layer of difficulty that you probably don't want to impose on yourself right off the bat if, if you become comfortable with one then you can work on the other but working on them both and you, you can see like when i draw it quickly this just goes to complete crap like this looks nothing like a cube so you have to be pretty uh patient and meticulous with it but doing both at once is probably not the best idea so you can you can actually do like one sometimes you'll maybe practice just them out of context just randomly rotated uh, boxes and sometimes you can practice these but then keep in mind that you're probably going to struggle more and maybe you'll, you'll not for sure nor keep the proportions as perfectly but uh, it's 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 kind of a b bumpy road but uh separating as much and as possible also, go ahead if we relate that back to his his mannequin if you simplify your mannequin more it will be easier to stack the forms on top of each other anyway like the arms because it'll be sim more simplified for your for you to be able to do so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can and also then, do boxes on boxes as well, like, because that's often what yeah. happens here, is, like, th there's just differently angled boxes, so you can have, like, a box that actually rests on another box. Let, let's say, for example, in here, here's my new box that's kind of balancing on this one. And that's kind of what happens with, let's say, like, a neck, except it extends. So this would be a neck from a torso, just as an example. But, uh just a modified version so you can start relating the boxes to each other 
before you even modify them, before you start chopping parts off or tapering or anything like that. And as Ali said, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with this, then modify as little as possible. Like keep keep as few parts as possible, which is kind of what Ellie's doing on her um, on her sheets, but also modify as little as possible. Like instead of, and let's just to kind of wrap it up. Like if you, if you compare certain aspects, like for example, her forearm is just a cylinder, essentially just like a slightly contour modified cylinder, but that's a lot more simple than using a cylinder that has an angle. This is much more difficult to construct. Or for example, in here, this is just a sphere, which is very easy to construct because it has no spatial orientation. It's just taking up space, but it's not oriented anywhere. It's not facing anywhere. So there's just a floating sphere and a cylinder, as opposed to a, a box and a cylinder that's also relating to the box in a very specific way. It's touching the box. So I would just kind of, when you simplify, you can spam this a lot more. You can get a lot more mileage with it because it takes less time and it's more manageable and do more of these and then eventually start adding complexity as you sense that you're becoming more and more comfortable with them. Awesome. That helps out a ton. All the advice that both you and we gave. Hey, and I can't wait to start applying it. Thank you Let's very much. Let's go. And, and, and feel free if you want to use my sheet as like a reference by all means. Just use it. I already saved it. Good. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, yeah, and you know, Ogden said like the, this cat the, doing it this s simply will be harder to add like anatomy on top. Um, but that, that also depends, right? Like on your skill levels, some people still, if they're advanced, still just draw a simple idea of a, a mannequin in, in ideation phases because they can, as Ogden says, you can do it quickly, right? You yeah, can just get yeah. it out. Depends on the intention. So, yeah, so you don't have to think about, oh no, how am I going to draw like a deltoid on top of this circle? Like, you don't have to worry about that yet. Well, here's um, yeah, here's the actual the actual point is like, th this is what I mean to say is this is not accurate to the surface forms of the body if you just use a cylinder, but it's true. It's actually true on one level. This is, or in in any case, it's at least useful. Like having a cylinder has its use, and in insofar as it's useful, it's true that. The, the arm is a cylinder, the upper arm is a cylinder. It's also true that it could be a box and a cylinder, but the question is, do you have the time or do you even need this amount of information for this particular uh, construction? So these are both true at once, and one, only one builds on top of the other. Only the more complex one builds on top of the simpler one. So you would need to start with the simpler one and have the ability to execute it reliably to even add additional information. But the issue is that the sort of, uh, problem with beginners and intermediates is you, you see the surface form and you over focus on it and you sort of worry about the problem that you're not at yet which is like how am I going to add that final accurate surface form uh, as opposed to just how, how do I become able to do these through very simple useful uh, constructions this is going to save me so many headaches yeah. that's why we're yeah. here Teaching Tuesday. I just hit my microphone. I'm sorry about that. But uh, yes, very, very good, very good. Who's uh, gonna do the outro? Cool. Well, you can if you want to. Thank you so much. I'm so happy about. It. <laughs> yes, I get to do the outro. Thank you guys yes. so much for being here with us for another epic session of Teaching Tuesdays. Another one for the books. This one was quite, quite great. We'll continue doing it essentially this way where. The Tuesdays will be art what related stuff with, I think we'll limit it to eight feedbacks. I think that's pretty good. I'll try to mm -hmm. be a little more concise. If you want to join in, if you're looking or if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to join in on the fun and get submitted, get your feedback given, go to artwad.com. We're actually having a flash sale right at this very moment, which is a very strange convenience. Uh, but yeah, go to artwad.com if you're interested. There's... The, the initial lesson that I gave is sort of an excerpt from a course. So we have courses uh, that uh, expand on the stuff that I'll talk about in these lessons as well, which is nice. And uh, yeah, that's that's about it. So thanks again for watching. Thank you guys for submitting your stuff. And we will see you next Tuesday. See you around, guys. Okay, actually, what? Friday.
Yeah, Friday, true, yeah. very true. So true. Feedback Friday. Let's go. <laughs> All right. That will be live stream on Instagram. Not yeah, it will Instagram. be on Instagram. So you should you should follow Art Wad on Instagram. Art underscore Wad. That's it. Yes. Let's go. Plugs. Right. Have a good evening, guys. Right. <laughs>